be able to ring 30 seconds more by not playing with the slides. <laughs> All right. Okay, I, I won't stand up and rant to do it. Um, it must be a wonderful thing to live in a world where you are never wrong, only not yet understood or misunderstood. I fear the problem, Aubrey, is that I do understand you rather too well. You clearly do not understand me. Put your hands up if you wear contact lenses, please. Keep your hands up if you've ever worn Proclear. Some of you have. Okay. I helped build those, actually. Okay. I am a basic scientist. I have also put products on the shelves. Okay. The fact you don't know that about me does not mean that I didn't do it. And it doesn't mean that I can be dismissed as somebody who wears a white coat and talks in jargon. Okay? The other thing that I think is probably worthwhile bringing up, since I didn't really want to do with this, but I will do, okay? No, you never said, hello, I'm Professor de Grey. You never stopped people assuming you were a member of academic staff. Okay. Who did? Who ever assumed that? Well, all the journalists, we have a Channel 4 documentary with your um, former head of department saying he was tired of people ringing up asking for Professor de Grey. I didn't write that, mate. I was embarrassed when it came out, actually. Okay. But so in that sense, choosing not to... Choosing an, implicature to lie, choosing an implicature is not exactly a lie, but it's not exactly telling the truth. And what I worry about is the fact that you importune the motives of people who could have had an honest view about what is a very difficult field. The last thing that I think is worth bringing up before we start rolling around the floor fighting, okay, or that it's been known in the Sheldonian before, okay, comes down to something that you said, and I'm not going to go through your slides, we can talk about this later, okay? Well, you turned around and said, compression of morbidity isn't happening. Now, I'm comfortable, you may not work on compression of morbidity, but out there in Radioland, there are an awful lot of gerontologists who do, including me. And I'll kind of tell you why through an anecdote. A colleague of mine has a father who is in his last stages of his life. And uh, my colleagues, children are very upset about this. Their grandfather is not, because he's turned around and said, I am in perfect health. I have a few weeks, which is long enough to say goodbye, and long enough to tidy up my affairs. And that is what I would like. And when we start talking about thousand year lifespans, escape velocity, we lose that and we lose the benefits that compression of morbidity and the therapies that we try to develop can bring. And let's put it this way, your own slides show something that we often suspected. Okay, calorie restriction. Doesn't lengthen lifespan in rodents, but does in, in primates, but does improve health. That's compression of morbidity, at least in my book. The senescent cell data improves health span in those mice and doesn't lengthen lifespan. That's compression of morbidity to me. And so therefore what it says is, we can get compression of morbidity in potentially two ways. By extending lifespan and keeping the morbid period the same, by keeping lifespan the same, and compressing morbidity within that. Either of those counts as a win. But unless we are focused on the potential of our research in the short term to bring about benefits to older people, we are an irrelevance. We have become a glorified version of blokes talking down the pub about what will happen in 20,000 years. Okay? And I did all that before I joined the scientific community, not after it.